Hello, and welcome to our sixth All In Chicago Breakfast Summit. My name is John Koenigsnecht, and I'm truly honored to be the president of Community Health's Board of Directors. As many of you know, and some may not yet know, but we're working hard on that. Community Health is the largest volunteer-based free health center in the United States, right here in Chicago. We provide primary and specialty care, prescription medications, mental health services, dental services through our on-site dental clinic, health education and lab testing, including COVID testing, all from our facility on the west side of Chicago. Our patients have no health insurance and we provide all the services and at the highest quality standards to them at no charge. We do this entirely with the support of over 1,000 healthcare provider volunteers, partnerships with dozens of institutions, and critically important donations from generous people like you. It has never been more important than under the current pandemic conditions to have the conversations we will have today and for us to have support of leaders like all of you. Thank you for being here and supporting Community Health. I would like to especially recognize some of our sponsors in this All In series, including Baxter, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Illinois, AbbVie, Lundbeck, the Joseph and Bessie Feinberg Foundation, West Monroe Partners, and many others. I encourage you to visit our website, allin-chicago.org. Again, that's allin-chicago.org to see the complete list of sponsors, read the bios of our incredible speakers, and check out the rest of the month's upcoming events. Finally, I wanna recognize this year's All In Executive Leadership Council. We have the privilege of having four outstanding leaders serving on the council this year. Their great insights and support have been instrumental to bringing this year's series to life. Thank you. Thank you to Joe Flanagan, Kimberly Hobson, Stacy Lindau, and John Maples for your contributions this year. And now I'd like to introduce one of those Executive Leadership Council members, Joe Flanagan. Joe is the CEO of Acquirent, and chair of the board of the Cook County Health Foundations. Take it away, Joe. Thanks, John. I'm proud to be here today and to be part of the All In Chicago 2020 series. The goal of the All In Chicago series is to bring together leaders from many different industries and segments of our population. Talk about how we can work together to ensure every resident has access to the right care in the right place at the right time. While we're doing things a little differently with the virtual broadcast this year, Community Health has been hosting these conversations around access to healthcare in Chicago since 2015. This year, we are all living in a global pandemic. The conversation feels uh, around access feels more relevant than ever. At Cook County Health, we care for over a half a million residents, many of whom are uninsured or on Medicaid. Because healthcare is so expensive, many of the people we work with find it unable to pay their doctors and hospital bills. And the burden of uncompensated care on the system is growing at an astronomical rate. Meanwhile, COVID-19 has brought on many new challenges uh, to providing both emergency and preventative care. This is a challenging topic and a challenging time in Chicago, but I'm looking forward to the insights today from two of our esteemed political leaders, as well as from the brilliant, brilliant panel we have lined up to discuss these issues. I really believe that success is within reach if we work together. It's now my pleasure to introduce two individuals who are committed to achieving the success. First, Mayor Lori Lightfoot will share some remarks on today's discussion and immediately following, Cos Congressman uh, Jesus Chuy Garcia will offer his insights. Representative Garcia has been a powerful voice in Illinois and beyond, particularly for the immigrant population, so many of whom struggle with access to, uh, to care. Thank you again for, uh, for coming, and please join me in welcoming our two special guests. Hello everyone, this is Mayor Lori Lightfoot, and I want to welcome you to the sixth annual All In Chicago Breakfast Summit. 
We are meeting during a moment like no other, one defined by COVID-19 and its disproportionate impact on our communities of color. Become increasingly clear as we look at the data. Chicago's black residents testing positive for COVID-19 at twice the rate of our white residents. Meanwhile, it's more than three times higher for our Latinx population. Make no mistake, these disparities stem from the unjust policies, institutions, and unequal access to resources that impact our lives every single day. We know that the increased risk our communities of color face is due to a lack of access to affordable, high-quality health care and health insurance. For example, the U.S. Census Bureau reported just a few years ago that more than one out of every six Latinx Chicagoans was uninsured. We know that our uninsured rate overall was on the rise before COVID-19. And now, many more residents are left without health insurance as over a million jobs were lost in Illinois alone due to the pandemic. We need to accept health care for the right that it is. No one should have to suffer because they cannot afford to see a doctor. And no one should have to put off getting care until a condition has simply become unbearable. As a result, we have a responsibility to make sure that Chicago's safety net hospitals and community-based health centers are there to provide the care that residents need. That means making sure that they have everything to address the issues of cost barriers for the uninsured and delayed and insufficient insurance reimbursements for the insured. Because right now, our safety net providers are facing a mountain of uncompensated care with over half a billion dollars in the Cook County system alone last year. I want to thank our health care providers for working hard to ensure we all receive the highest quality care possible when we need to go see the doctor. And I know that care requires resources which can be impacted by the burden of unreimbursed health services. I am pleased to be part of today's discussion and working with all of you to find ways to build a more equitable health care system. Because every Chicagoan has a right to the right care in the right place and at the right time. And I am all in to building that right here in Chicago for all of our residents. Thank you again and please continue to be safe. Good morning, uh, everyone. Welcome to the All in Chicago 6th Annual Breakfast Summit. And thank you, Community Health, for inviting me today. I'm delighted to be joined by our Mayor, Lori Lightfoot. COVID-19 has proven to be the biggest challenge our country has faced in our lifetime. To say that we're all exhausted would be an understatement. I didn't ha it didn't have to be this way. This public health crisis has painfully demonstrated that COVID-19 does not discriminate. And yet, communities of color continue dying at higher rates. One zip code determines exposure, access to care, and the chances to live or die. And while some are now just learning about the persistent health disparities in our country, for others, this has been our life experience, and all we've ever known. Yes, the COVID-19 health disparities we are witnessing are very real, but let me make it clear. Communities of color have experienced a lack of affordable quality health care long before this pandemic. Providing adequate health care for immigrants is critical for public health. Parts of my district remain among the highest in COVID cases, yet many remain uninsured. There are still too many barriers to affordable, quality health care for immigrant communities. While the ACA expanded access to health care in historic ways, we know that many Latinos and immigrants, including those living throughout Chicagoland, remain without access. There are language and cultural barriers that must be addressed. Some immigrant families simply forego health care altogether, especially under this administration, because they fear interacting with public agencies. When people are forced to live in fear because of their immigration status, their health, 
and the health of our country suffers. From farm workers to grocery store employees, immigrants across the country remain on the front lines as essential workers, but are still being treated as expendable. Many in my community were ineligible for any sort of government assistance simply because of their immigration status. In many cases, even if only one person in a household of five or six is undocumented, the entire family did not receive any help. Well, I've been back in Chicago. My focus has been to hear from our community organizations and stakeholders, to learn directly from them on the challenges they are experiencing. To no other workplace protections and even more afraid to come home to their families to expose them. I've heard from neighbors that have tested positive and cannot work and provide for their families. I've heard from small businesses closing across the Chicagoland area because they're unable to meet bills and payroll. I've heard from teachers concerned for the safety and mental health needs of their students. It's these stories that I take to heart and remind me of what we're fighting for. These stories bring to light the reality of the situation for our communities. These stories also remind me of what we're fighting for at the federal level. I'm working hard to ensure that our communities, black, Latino, Asian, native or white, receive the help they need and deserve. That is why I recently introduced the Health Equity and Accountability Act. HEAA aims to close the gap in health outcomes for all minorities, and it includes provisions that would mitigate the harm this pandemic and other future disasters pose. Operating from a health equity lens is the only way we'll ever beat COVID-19. Similarly, many cities and states have stepped in and provided much needed support while working from a health equity framework. I commend Chicago for providing the economic and health resources for all, regardless of immigration status, and Illinois for leading by example by recently becoming the only state to extend Medicaid-like benefits to seniors, regardless of immigration status. Finally, I applaud the efforts of local organizations and community health centers who fill in the gaps left by the federal government. Even before the pandemic, community health leaders in serving our low-income, uninsured, and undocumented communities. And now, they have been working hard to be a source of care and comfort for our communities during this public health crisis. They truly understand that our country is only as strong as our most vulnerable during the pandemic and beyond. As we look ahead, if we are serious about controlling the spread of COVID, our response efforts cannot have a plan that ignores communities of color or immigrants. Anything less will perpetuate the inequities that are silencing and literally killing our communities. And we simply can't do it individually. This public health crisis requires our collective effort as a response. If we are serious about preventing the spread of COVID-19, our communities have to be at the table. As trusted members of their communities and as the real experts on the ground, it is imperative that our organizations continue playing a key role in these efforts. Finally, this moment requires real, compassionate, and courageous leadership at all levels, especially since it is lacking at the highest levels in this country. We need empathy more now than ever. The bottom line is that we cannot continue business as usual. The pandemic requires us to take bold steps to address these disparities. We must ensure that if we face another public health emergency, we will be better prepared to protect our communities. I often hear how we need to get back to normal,
But the truth is that we can't go back to normal. We must do better, especially for communities of color whose lives depend on it. One day, when this is all over, we'll look back and I hope we remember who stood on the front lines and kept this country running. We owe it to them, now and in the years to come. Thank you to everyone for all the work that you do and thanks again to Community Health for leading this summit. Thank you for those uh, powerful and impactful messages. Uh, and now we, uh, we bring you the conversational portion of the, of the morning's events. Uh, one quick housekeeping item. Uh, this conversation is happening live, so please be sure to submit your questions uh, for our panelists. We will do our best to answer as many as possible in the next half hour or so. Just submit your question using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. It's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's conversa conversation, Antonia Cerejido. Antonia is a producer uh, for the NPR program, Latino USA, and is bringing us this important information all the way from the Big Apple, New York City. Thanks for being here, Antonia. Thanks so much, Joe, for that introduction. And um, I just wanna thank Community Health for inviting me to this event. Um, I got to know the clinic last year when I spent three days sort of embedded for a documentary that we did on Latino USA about their work and seeing there, we saw a lot of fear and anxiety as, as happens at a place like a clinic, but we also saw a lot of joy and hard work and it was a pleasure uh, to see that community and I'm happy to be back in the community health fold. Um, and I'm very excited to introduce our accomplished and insightful panelists. Rob Christie is the Senior Vice President of External Affairs for Northwestern Memorial Healthcare, a role which combines the Community Relations, Community Services, and Government Relations Departments at Northwestern. Dr. Aida Diacello is an educator and a writer who uses research to address health equity and social justice issues. She is a research professor at the Department of Preventative Medicine, Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University. Dr. Linda Murray is an honorary attending of Cook County Health and is an adjunct assistant professor at the University of Illinois School of Public Health. She has been a voice for social justice and health as a basic human right for over 50 years. And finally, Steph Wilding is the CEO of Free Health, the largest free health clinic in the United States and the host of the All In Chicago series. Prior to joining Community Health last year, Steph has led transformative initiatives at two of Chicago's largest federally qualified health centers. Panelists, welcome. Um, and also, I just want to remind everyone that you can set, submit questions uh, using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. I will try to answer as many of those as possible throughout the program. Um, let's dive right in. Uh, Dr. Murray. Equity can be this sort of buzzword that is heard a lot. Um, and we heard already in this program, some alarming statistics about how immigrant Latinx and black communities are impacted. But from your personal experience, what does inequity look like? You're muted, sorry. Sorry about that. I think people can easily get confused about what the word equity looks like. A lot of people in the United States talk about equality, uh, which is a similar concept. But what we really mean by equity, and especially health equity, is that people get what they need based on what illnesses they have, or what, more importantly, what we need to keep people healthy. Um, and so that means that if you have young children, you don't give them the same thing that you give somebody that's 30. And you don't give a 30-year-old that's working the same thing that someone that's elderly might need. So equity, I think, is a better way to think of it for most people is what do we fairly need? How do we fairly distribute the resources we have in order to make sure that people are as healthy as they can be? And now I was muted. <laughs> uh, Dr. Tiachelo, the same question for you. I know that you work a lot with the Latinx community. Um, how have you seen inequity impact uh, there? Well, first of all, inequity is associated with social and economic and environmental condition 
And those that are particularly most affected happen to be the poor. And disproportionately among the poor, African-American, Latino, the uninsured, the migrant population and immigrants, people who don't speak well English, people who live in segregated communities where they don't have, they have a sense of hopelessness. They don't have equal access to social services, to quality care, but also quality of education, housing, and the list goes on. So in, in reality, in regards to Latinos, we, we are part of that group that I just mentioned that experiences serious of social and economic disadvantages reflected in low levels of education, low levels of income, and a series of problems in accessing health and medical care. Steph, what does uncompensated care mean specifically within the context of a free clinic? Great, thank you for, for that question and good morning, uh, everyone. Um, it's an honor to, to be on this panel uh, with the, the other panelists. Um, so from background, free um, clinics are community health centers that primarily serve low, in, low income uninsured patients. So our business model works a little bit differently in the safety net where we leverage in-kind resources such as volunteer doctors, donated goods, um, as well as private donations and grants in order to provide medical, dental, and behavioral health care to patients at no cost to that patient. Um, so for community health, for example, which we heard at the top of um, the event from, from John, we provide primary care, specialty care, such as endocrinology, cardiology, dental services, behavioral health care. We have an on-site pharmacy, we have a lab, and we provide health education to patients through a network of more than a thousand volunteers. Again, all at no cost to the patient. So our role within the healthcare ecosystem is to essentially catch those uninsured individuals and leverage volunteerism and philanthropy to ensure that these patients have access to high quality care in a cost efficient manner. So unlike some of the other panelists um, on today's panel, for a free health center, um, Patients for us that, that may by other panelists be considered an un uncompensated visit or a charity care patient um, is actually our target population. Um, and through our business model, we're able to provide patients who otherwise would have very few choices, access to high quality um, healthcare at um, the, the best, best efficiency from a cost perspective. Rob. Um, how would you define uncompensated care at Northwestern and what impact does that have on the hospital? Uh, what systems are in place for uninsured? Well, thank you, Antonio. It's, uh, it's, it's great to be part of this panel um, and I'm very proud of our longstanding relationship that we've had with community health um, over, the, um, over the many years. Um, at, at Northwestern Medicine, uh, we're very proud of the fact that um, uh, we continue to lead in the area of uh, uncompensated care or charity care. Um, do our downtown hospital, Northwestern Memorial Hospital, continues to be the second largest provider of charity care um, over any other hospital in the state of Illinois, except for Cook County Hospital. And how do we do that? Why, you know, we're located downtown, we're in Streeterville, a lot of people say, wow, how, how do you, where do your uncompensated care patients come from? Well, it comes from a long-standing relationship that we have with our many community partners, such as Near North um, and Erie, um, two major FQHC partners, along with Community Health. A lot of patients come to us to our emergency department, and many times, quite often, it's, it's not for an emergency, but that's their only touch to healthcare. Um, they make their way to downtown, they get come to our emergency department, we find out you really didn't need to come to the emergency department for this care. You do have a chronic condition. What we really need to do is find you a medical home um, and let's get you to the best place for such care. So we have this thing called the follow-up clinic. Those patients will then be sent to the follow-up clinic the same day. They'll be discharged from the emergency department, sent to the follow-up clinic and evaluation will be made where they live. Um, where's our closest community partner that we can find a, a primary care physician for them. Let's go ahead and set up an appointment with them. Let's give them the meds that they will need for the next 10 days until that appointment occurs. And then we'll hand them off to that community partner. 
And then if they need to come back for either diagnostics or specialty care or hospitalization, they're, they're, they're welcome back. They come back through that relationship. So uh, just as we do with uh, the doctors um, who, uh, who give their volunteer time at community health, we have residents who provide um, support to our FQHC partners. That's the trade-off. We give them some support, they give us support. Um, it's, it's a good, good community um, uh, coordination of care uh, model that uh, we've used in our other hospitals. We now have 10 hospitals in our system. Uh, we have worked with uh, our FQHC partners up in Lake County and Waukegan um, and created a relationship with Erie in a new site up there uh, in emulating the same kind of care so that we know that it works. Um, and thank goodness for the Affordable Care Act that covered many, many more individuals in Illinois. But as Congressman Garcia pointed out, those that are here on an undocumented status do not have access to the Affordable Care Act. And there are many others that either just became uninsured or just don't have the wherewithal. They're welcome uh, at our hospital and many other hospitals around, around the community. And uh, that's what, that's what uh, free care or charity care um, is in a hospital like ours. And this is, this is a question for all panelists. How has COVID impacted um, issues of equity in Chicago? Well, I'll take a stab at that. I, you know, clearly we have seen across all of Chicago that the communities that have been hit the hardest are those disadvantaged communities on the south and west sides of Chicago. 45% of our inpatient load of COVID patients that had to receive inpatient care uh, come from either the south or, or west sides of Chicago, which uh, clearly um, uh, points out that uh, there are health disparities in those communities. So COVID is just putting an exclamation point to um, a situation that we already knew existed. You know, this is Aida. I could add that before the pandemic, uh, we know that there is a strong association between poverty and poor health. So people were already were experiencing those that are below poverty level, particularly were experiencing a series of health disparity reflected in diabetes type two, high blood pressure, cardiovascular condition, obesity, and the list goes on and on and on. With the pandemic, those conditions have become very clear and have become even have worsened. And on top of that, we know the data indicated prior to the pandemic, people had less than $500 in a bank account. So with a pandemic and losing their jobs, not having food in their table, not being able to pay the rent or losing their homes, it is really aggravated not only their, their medical condition if they have one, but also the mental health, the stress, the social isolation, all that have really have made very clear because it has been all system in our society that clearly have been contributing for the longest time to this social and racial inequality that exists. And so it has become very clear how all the institutions in society have been contributing to the conditions of poor health of racial and ethnic minority and other vulnerable population. So it's really as a result of this has worsened the situation, have widened the inequity that exists in our society. I think it's important, I, I agree with what the other two speakers said, but the global pandemic really, you can look at it as pulling the covers off of our society and, and revealing all the cracks and gaps and, and problems. So certainly people that are poor get the worst end of the deal, but it's important to understand that doesn't just come from comorbidities for people that have high blood pressure and diabetes. Look at what's happened in the past several months. Some people are, have the privilege, and it is a privilege, to sit at home and work uh, via Zoom. But many people can't do that. They are either unemployed or, more importantly, they're essential workers. Um, and those essential workers are generally underpaid. These are people not just working in hospitals, uh, which is important, in nursing homes, but also people that are uh, delivering the mail, people that are delivering your groceries, people that, that are trying to earn a living on Uber and Lyft. Uh, um, so that these essential workers, which we always disrespect, we don't treat them with dignity, uh, we act like stocking a, a grocery store shelf is, is unimportant, uh, have really been putting their lives on the line. So, so I would say that that role of 
people of color as essential workers, in addition to underlying poor health, but probably the role as essential workers are even more critical to the differences we've seen in morbidity and mortality. If you don't have a car and you have to go to work and you get on a crowded bus or you get it on a crowded subway, your chances of getting infected are, are greater. But this goes beyond just physical health. We're, we're just beginning to see what happens in this kind of pandemic. Uh, this is gonna last for several more years. Uh, what is gonna happen to our children? I don't care whether the schools are in person or whether they are remote. The children that already are half class sizes of 40 are not gonna get educated. Um, the bad education they get uh, is gonna be even worse. So we're gonna see this rebound throughout this generation and we're gonna be feeling the effects of this pandemic for, for decades. Yeah, I, I actually wanted to, to echo Dr. Murray's sentiments. Um, you know, before the pandemic, um, the life expectancy disparity between someone who lived downtown and someone who lived on the west side, which is just six miles, is a difference of 16 years. And this was before, before the pandemic. Um, and as we heard in Mayor Lightfoot's speech, Black and Latinx communities were disproportionately impacted by COVID, and that's primarily the, the demographic makeup on the west side. One of my concerns as a result of COVID is also related to the Latinx community um, and our mixed status and undocumented residents. You know, one of the things that we um, now know to be true is that for some, there are long-term health impacts of uh, having COVID-19. And for our undocumented residents who we've acknowledged don't have access to the Affordable Care Act and only a small portion now have access to a Medicaid-like product in the state of Illinois. How are they going to continue to, to access their care and their ongoing needs? To speak to Dr. Murray's point about the longevity of the impacts of all of this. I also wanted to note um, something that hasn't brought up, been brought up yet, um, but certainly was referenced in Dr. Murray's speech about fair distribution of resources, particularly in healthcare, and just shine a light on a concern that is not necessarily related uh, to COVID, but certainly will impact everything else around it, which is the equitable distribution of hospital access in the city of Chicago. Um, you know, as we've all heard, South Shore um, recently made the announcement that they will be closing. And this is on the heels of closures on the far west side with Westlake and on the far south side with Metro South. So everything that the other panelists have mentioned um, about how COVID-19 has impacted communities of color is only gonna be further exacerbated um, by continued lack of access for our Latinx community, as well as um, even deepening inequities in hospital access throughout the city of Chicago, particularly on the south and west sides. Hello. Oh, yes. Yeah, I just want to add that in terms of the Latino community, the infection rate is the highest in the city of Chicago, it's about 47%. At time, it has been as high as 55%. Of all the new cases, the infection occurred primarily in certain communities, and those communities happen to be communities where Latinos or African American live. In the case of Latino, you have the Pilsen, the Little Village area, the uh, West, uh, West Lawn, Chicago Lawn, and Belmont Craig and in the north side. Those are areas that have over 18% infection rate compared to the 5.2 for the city of Chicago as a whole. When you look at the state of Illinois, you have civil and pattern. All those counties that are right now with the highest infection rate of the 15 most higher infection rate county, nine of them happen to be Latinos. And many of them work are seasonal or unseasonal migrant workers working in the food processing industry. And for which they, like many others have said already, they are working in close proximity. They don't really have access to care. Their living conditions are worsened. I mean, in reality, it is very, very serious what happened with the essential workers that Linda Murray mentioned. And the fact that Latinos are less active likely to have a medical home, are less likely to have health insurance. Prior to the Obama Affordable Care Act, the uninsured rate in Chicago was about 54%. Um, after Obama, it has lower, um, it has gotten better, but it's still not at that level. And now with all the changes in Washington, these things are worsening. So in reality, they're most likely to have received services with lack of bilingual by cultural staff, 
with the pandemic, there's been a lot of stories about being rejected when they go to the emergency room because they're not sick enough. They have to be really almost dying before many hospitals are willing to provide them care or to uh, get them into inpatient services. So the, the list goes on of the many barriers they have kept Latinos and other vulnerable population out of the medical care system. We commend the community health because for the, the longest time, since 1993, they've been providing services to this population, but they could only do so much. And in reality, the need is very high. Latino were primarily receiving, for example, through health fair, they were getting the kids to get some basic screening for in preparation for school. That's not happening. So we don't know right now. And, and the immunization rate, when you look at that, Latinos and African American and others have one of the lowest immunization rates. So we are we don't know now with the whole pandemic how those rate is even going to get worsened as a result of what's happening. You know, one thing I think the pandemic should force us to do is really look at what we need to keep people healthy and what makes people sick. So people on this panel that have worked in this area for decades, we often talk about social determinants of health. That is people don't have transportation to get to a doctor, they don't have medical insurance, they may not be able to afford the prescription. But I think we have to go further upstream. We have to really ask ourselves, why are we, the richest country in the world, performing the worst of any of the rich countries? Um, and, and it's not all because of who sits in the White House. Uh, hopefully that problem will be solved eventually. Um, the, the real issue is that we have a country that doesn't recognize that medical care is a basic human right. Um, we don't have universal health coverage. Uh, the uh, Obamacare was a small reform. It wasn't adequate. Uh, and, and we should stop pretending that it was adequate. We have to have basic stuff. So, so I'm going to be very honest with you. If we're going to control this pandemic, we have to start funding public health. We lost over a quarter of a million uh, public health workers in the past 20 years in this country. So we can't actively launch good contact tracing. We don't we didn't have the lab capacity to do the diagnosis. Uh, we don't have in all of our communities around the country uh, a scientifically based, well-trained uh, public health workforce. And so we see the epidemic going around in circles and that'll continue until we have a national plan. Uh, until we, we should pass a single payer health system in the first 100 days of a Biden administration. It's immediately necessary, it's an emergency. Today, we have people who were hospitalized, fortunately lived and left the hospital, but they might need oxygen and there was no coverage for those oxygen tanks that they needed when they went home. It's not acceptable to have people running around looking for medical care. Uh, that it's critical that we provide that to everyone who's walking around in the country, regardless of immigration status or anything else. Um, and so in many parts of the world, even a visitor and a tourist will get covered. Uh, when they're in that country. Um, we have to have a living wage. We cannot expect people to function if they work every day and, and can't support themselves. And in fact, we have to have a minimum wage whether you're working or not. We have to address the things in our society that allow people to stay healthy. If we don't do that, when we're burdened with a global pandemic where we don't have a good vaccine, we don't have good treatment, and we need worldwide cooperation to bring it under control, we are really gonna be lost. And unfortunately, hundreds of thousands of more people in this country and millions around the world will die because we don't have those structural factors that we need to allow people to stay healthy. Uh, a lot of, um, one of the things that's happened since the pandemic is that there's been a lot of conversation about reimagining the economy or reimagining agriculture. And I hear all of you speak so passionately about the changes that need to happen, but also, you know, the health healthcare workers are being more directly impacted than these other sectors, right? There was this feeling of pause maybe in, in other places. Is there space to reimagine? Do you feel like the pandemic is opening, uh, uh, is creating an opening or, or does that seem not possible? I think the space is always there to reimagine. I mean, you know, we reimagine the world without chattel slavery. Uh, so I don't even like the word. Really. Yes, there, people have been fighting for a different world by different standards in this country for hundreds of years. And, and clearly that's always on the agenda as far as I'm concerned. Hopefully what happens because of the pandemic is it's easier for more people to see the underlying problems and faults in this country. 
when we place uh, profits of an oil company above children's health, that creates some problems. Or, or we allow children to just drink water that's poisoned with lead, those are real problems. And it does not have to be that way. Um, and so I think if we prioritize human needs and we understand that our human health is tied up with our neighbors and that the whole country's health is tied up with what goes on around the world, including in poorer countries, then we have a chance to have an agenda that allows the world to be healthy and free. But many of the solution has been shared in the past in many different settings. What we are asking is investment in our communities, invest in the infrastructure, improve the quality of education, the quality of, of housing. There's a number of areas for which investment could be made, even including community-based organizations, grassroots groups that are always there in the good time or in the bad time. They're always there serving the community. There's a lot that can be done immediately. We need to stop gentrification in many other communities, including West Town, where you're at, and Humboldt Park and in, in nearby vicinity. I mean, in reality, there's so much that needs to be done and needs to be done now if we want to really put a stop or some of the inequity that exists in our society, including here in Chicago. I'd like to pick up on something that Dr. Murray said. I really liked her statement that COVID pulled the covers back and kind of exposed what was, what was there that uh, was previously covered up. One of the things that Congress did in the CARES Act, um, and, and the President has done, one of the right things that he's done, not many, but uh, at least through executive orders, is they've said to hospitals, do not refuse to accept any patient who has COVID. You will be reimbursed. Guess what? That's universal coverage for COVID patients. So we're kind of in an experiment, Antonia, right now learning how this experiment is gonna work. Now the CARES Act was not cheap. It's very expensive. We need to do more and Congress is, is poised hopefully to do more uh, this month. Um, and trillions have already been spent. But we all got together and we said, this is a unique time in our history. We've never really faced anything like this. Let's, let's pull together. And when CARES Act passed, I think there were four dissenting votes in the House and three dissenting votes in the Senate. That's pretty bipartisan. And it virtually said, hospitals, you cannot refuse to treat any patient that has COVID. We will pay you. We will reimburse you. Um, let's see how that works. Let's see how much that costs and what can we learn from that? So, uh, yeah. oh, yes, sorry. I just wanted to, to mention one thing, Antonia, um, to kind of, you know, bring it back to the overall healthcare landscape and, and maybe that, that 10,000 foot view and, and reference back to Congressman Gar Garcia's video um, where he talks about how he hopes that we don't go back to the way it was before, that we don't go back to our normal. Um, I think that the pandemic within the healthcare industry um, really has been a catalyst and has forced us to innovate and to move quickly in a way that I don't know that we have been able to in the past for a myriad of reasons. Um, and so in that regard, I think that um, to, to echo the sentiments of the other panelists, we have time right now in the very near term to make innovations to, to make big changes, um, whether it's at the local level within the community, um, for example, in how community health responds to this, or whether we're at our state and, and federal levels. Um, we have a very um, unique moment in time right now to, to continue to think differently, continue to innovate, um, particularly in healthcare, um, and to, to push forward in a, in, on a path that um, wouldn't have been possible without as Dr. Murray said, pulling the covers back um, on the inequities that existed, not only within with healthcare, but, but everything um, around it and, and the social determinants of health. I'm gonna read some of the, um, the attendees' questions. So Pragni Dave asks, of the multitude of issues facing Chicago's healthcare ecosystem right now, wages, lack of access, funding, et cetera, what do you see as the single most fundamental challenge that is our current local, that our current local administration should solve for? It's hard to pick just one, but if I have to pick just one, let me just say, and, 
and, and I say this, I, I always say this, and I'm, I'm sad that I have to say it almost every year. Um, we are in danger of use, losing our public system. We're in danger uh, of losing uh, the, the health care from Cook County Health. Uh, you know, I'm not a politician, so I don't have to pretend, but I can, I can read the balance sheet. We have major uh, budget deficits there. Uh, the amount of taxpayer money that supports that system has decreased drastically in the past uh, 10 or 15 years. Um, and uh, if that system comes down, it puts huge, tremendous pressure on our private not-for-profit system. And often people uh, don't look at that until it happens. Just like Mercy Hospital, uh, people were very upset as they should be. Mercy Hospital, as many people know, is our uh, oldest hospital in Chicago. When it closed, uh, I got a number of calls, but I said, but Mercy Hospital was in trouble for years. And, and, and if you had asked me before it closed, which hospitals are the most likely to close, they would have been on the list. So one thing I think that's important for the medical community to do is to be honest with each other, look at each other and understand what's going on and how they're interconnected. Um, so uh, that, if, if I had to pick one, I don't think that's the only one, but that certainly would be one. Let me sneak in another one. We have to have better health planning. Uh, during uh, the COVID crisis here, there was better, much better planning than normally in terms of sharing ICU beds and the like, that's important. But there's absolutely no reason why our state can't fund the planning that we're theoretically supposed to do uh, so that we make sure that we, that we plan for the resources we have. We're not going to have everything we need instantly. One figure that it doesn't affect us in Chicago, we're very lucky. In the United States, there are 3,000 counties, more or less, in the United States. Only half of those, half of those counties have one ICU bed or none, half. So what happens in our rural counties uh, when COVID strikes? So we really have a, a, a maldistribution problem with the resources we have. We spend money on the wrong things. Um, and and the, thing I would, the most important thing is that we step in and begin to do something to fix these problems. Yes, I, I wanna echo Dr. Murray's sentiments on the, on the hospital piece, which I know I had mentioned um, earlier. Um, you know, specialty care access on the south and west sides, for example, is, is provided primarily through hospital systems. Um, and also to, to just clarify, I know I mentioned South Shore earlier and I, I did mean Mercy, but to, men to mention Dr. Murray's point, South Shore is another hospital that if you check out that balance sheet, it's concerning and it only becomes an issue after the announcement is made that it's going to close. And so, uh, you know, Mercy has made this announcement, but they're not the last hospital, safety net hospital that is in trouble. So we know a number of Southside hospitals, including St. Bernard and Trinity, um, tried to work together to develop a better system on the South side and, and that wasn't funded. And that wasn't funded. So when we talk about what can be done um, in the immediate, it's, it's preserving hospital access on the south and the west sides for our communities. Uh, D Miller 9 asks, please discuss how Healthy Chicago 2025 will support the agenda Dr. Murray and Dr. Diocello are describing. I have to admit that I haven't seen the plan recently, but I saw the previous one of 2020 and I was very disappointed. It didn't have enough content related to issues that affect certain populations such as Latino, very little about Latino health and health promotion and disease prevention. Although it did talk about HIV and it did talk about asthma and other conditions, but I was disappointed it was very limited in scope. So 2025, I will not be surprised if they have followed the same line of thought, but I'm not, I, you know, I don't remember right now in detail enough about the plan to be able to comment on it. You know, um, these health plans that the health departments put out are important. Uh, uh, they're required, we're required to put them out in order to be accredited as a decent health, health department. I think there's a, the thing to remember for public health, governmental public health, is there's a big difference between writing a bunch of goals and objectives down on paper and pretending to uh, be the culture of that process and actually moving to change governmental policies to make those plans come true. So what I would like to see uh, from the health, from all of our health departments, including the Chicago Health Department, is a willingness to speak up. And you know, it, it, some people say I'm 
naive because, you know, you can only go as far as your elected official allows you to go. Uh, well, I think we have an obligation in public health to speak appropriately. Uh, if we look at it, CDC at this moment, I, I hope this changes. Uh, we, have a, we have a federal agency, actually the premier agency in the world, now kowtowing to non-scientific notions and changing its guidance every other day. It's a real embarrassment to those of us in public health. So what I will say is people who are trained in public health and public health advocates, you have to speak the truth. And the truth is our governmental, the city of Chicago's funding uh, and budget, the state's funding and budget, and the county's funding and budget does not, is not aligned to improve people's health. Uh, so I, I don't particularly care what's in the plan. Uh, I agree with uh, Aida's uh, criticisms of it, but the, it's not great to have a perfect plan if you're not willing to organize to change the funding priorities and, make, and be able to implement that plan. That to me is the most important thing. Um, so uh, just writing a plan is something we let the students talk about doing as an exercise. I want to see public health leadership around the country step up and begin to demand and organize to realize those plans. Joanne Eisenberg asks, how can we create more educational opportunities to develop more community health care workers? It seems community health cannot operate without educational partners. Well, I, this is Aida. I agree wholly. I mean, and, and if you look at the model Costa Rica, South America, the model is one where they visit the home of the patient and the family, and they have a team that includes a community health worker with educational component. They have the nurse practitioner and they have the physician as needed. And part of the assessment when they go in the home is to assess the environmental condition or to what degree the family have water, uh, do they have the food in the table, electricity. So it's a whole assessment in trying to understand why some member of the family may have asthma, do they have too many animals in the home, so whatever. So it is, uh, the health educators very, very critical in community health workers for which we've been really uh, advocating for because they have been proven that they are effective in delivering the service in a culturally and linguistic appropriate manner, that they're able to communicate at the level that the person that is receiving the information can understand. Uh, education is critical, it's very critical, and, the, and part of the education is not educating about the condition that they may be experiencing, but it's health promotion, educate them about nutrition, lifestyle, stress management, engaging in many other elements that are critical to our health and for which at time are not given the, the appropriate attention. Yeah, I, I wanna echo, echo that as well um, related to the community health workers. And I think one of the challenges, for example, that community health has is as a result of the pandemic, some of our approaches to health education and health promotion where we're empowering our patients to, to be a partner in their wellness and their health aren't possible because we did a lot of that in group settings. Um, and so through the community health worker model, um, uh, where the, the individuals in the home um, were able to achieve that same um, impact uh, with a different, different approach. And I will say one of the interesting um, outcomes of using video-based tele telehealth during the pandemic has also been our providers getting that window into the home. Um, in a way that they didn't have before. And seeing the, um, the, the, the animals and, and the asthma thing is, is a prime example that maybe that hadn't come up in a visit before, but you see a little cat run across the, the, the screen. And so the pandemic is, is um, another example of, of around this, is, is forcing us to think differently and, and to invest our resources differently so that we can have a bigger impact on patients given these restrictions that are on us right now that are out of control, which we know are going to be in place for, for quite some time. So one thing we need if we want more community health workers is to have uh, free college tuition, free tra you know, you shouldn't have to pay money for that. So again, uh, every time we have a problem, we find all these problems are interconnected. And the second thing I want to say is community health workers actually have knowledge. They have knowledge of the communities from which they come. And so one of the things that I think is critical while we make sure that we have the resources to train people from communities immediately, not charge them money for it. They have to be paid a salary 
a, a real salary, a livable salary, not some small salary on some grant for a year. Uh, and the last thing I want to say is this. Um, you know, I grew up in the projects in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, and so I know what that means to live in public housing. And I'm a physician. So one thing, one reason we have community health workers, not the only reason, is because we have a physician workforce that is too white and doesn't reflect our, our neighborhood. So we have to do all of that at the same time. We have to create uh, career pathways for people from communities that can really reach patients on, on, on uh, a cultural and linguistic level that they understand. And we have to bring from those same communities people and train them as surgeons and nurses and anesthetists and pharmacists uh, if we want to have real equity in terms of healthcare. And I tend to agree because uh, most of the community health worker experience a job insecurity. They are usually listed in a particular green once the funding has ended, they lose the job. So you don't have the continuity that is needed to be able to provide the quality of care and, and the knowledge that they bring into the team of uh, providers. Um, I'm also, a, you know, a product of Spanish Harlem in New York City when I was raising, you know, when I was growing at the age of three to, to 10. And in reality, I always advocate for that investment in the community because the sense of despair that you see in poor areas and poor community where most of the people are, most of the poor and vulnerable population are raised, being raised and the segregation and violence and substance abuse. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And perhaps in my case, and maybe in Linda and Dr. Murray and others, that that has really gave us a sense of, of, of advocating and for social justice and for all the things that we have experienced to make sure that others would not experience. And so for the health community, health worker critical is, is a cadre of individual that if they have the brain, they have the skill, they have the communication ability, they have so much that it's just a matter of investing in them in terms of getting a college education so they could continue contributing and maximize their potential to, to the maximum. Um. The, the, I'm very inspired by all of these uh, answers. Um, we have, so a mysterious uh, anonymous attendee asks, how can all of us in the healthcare ecosystem, whether for-profit or non-for-profit organizations, work together better? What examples or partnerships have you seen that have worked well to deliver healthcare to those in our most vulnerable populations that would otherwise fall outside traditional safety nets? One of the uh, programs that uh, we're engaged with that was started, uh, I guess we're almost on our second year anniversary now, uh, was started by Senator Durbin and it's called the HEAL Initiative. Um, he got 10 hospitals together in the city of Chicago and he said, look, you guys are in the neighborhoods. You, uh, you know what's going on in the communities. Um, we have this violence problem and, and violence is a healthcare issue. Um, let's work on this together. So what are the programs that you've already been engaged in and what can we do differently? And the focus out of that um, uh, has become, let's hire from within uh, these communities and these identified 18 zip codes. Let's hire from within these communities. Let's provide career opportunities in the healthcare field. We just heard discussion about that. Um, and, and let's also, um, promote purchasing in these neighborhoods as well. So we work with a, an organization called CASE, Chicago Anchors for a Strong Economy, which is part of uh, World Business Chicago. CASE helps us identify vendors in uh, uh, pockets of Chicago that we may not be aware of, that we could be doing business with. We're buying you know, thousands of X and thousands of Y, we have national purchase uh, contracts. Why can't we say to our national purchasers, hey, we have people in the city of Chicago that, uh, that make those supplies. We want you to contract with them as well. So we have put upon ourselves uh, measurable goals uh, that we have to reach um, over the next three years. Um, and so it's, it's a focus of jobs and it's a focus of employment through, through purchasing in those neighborhoods and let's see what happens. But that was a collaboration where Senator Durbin got 10 CEOs together and said, we need to do something to make a difference. I tell you what, every one of those CEOs in the room and they get together three times a year, 
are very uh, anxious to see this work and we're very anxious to come up with ideas that are measurable so that we can see our progress. One thing that I would like to, to see as a plan is for the hospitals to have a, a, a payment plan that makes sense. Um, the CEOs of our big hospitals are often making the millions of dollars. How big of a gap is that between what the lowest paid worker in that hospital makes? So one thing that was an immediate investment in those communities from which those workers come from is to raise the worker's salary. We need to have a, a minimum salary in the hospital sector that's very different and much higher, much higher than $15 an hour. Uh, I would love to see where the ratio between the CEO and the lowest paid worker comes down to be no more than 20 or 25 times what the lowest uh, paid worker gets. So, so that's a way to begin to make sense in the hospital. Some of our hospitals, for example, even in COVID, have begun layoffs. So what, what sense does that make? Be laying off healthcare workers where, it, where we're literally in the beginning of a global pandemic. So it's not enough just to have a good, one good program. We have to really look to how to change the structures of how we organize our work. I just want to add that, that it's critical in terms of building partnerships and coalition that it has to be community driven. It has to be at the neighborhood level where you also have not only the hospitals and the clinic, but you have the chambers of commerce involved that you have because they could bring the food industry from that area to eliminate some of the food desert that some community experience. You need to have a diversity of other sectors that are not traditionally involved in healthcare. And then the community together with all those representatives could develop an action plan with clear, measurable objectives that are doable and for which the community is driven. Most of the action plan, I mean, not action plan, but most of the need assessment that are done are really are not taking into consideration what the community wants and need. And we need in the process to facilitate empowerment of the community, but also provide the resources that are needed to implement innovative ideas. Our community leaders, community residents, when you connect with them and, and consult them, they have all this wonderful creative way of seeing the world and how many of those problems that they are experiencing can be solved. But we need to give them the opportunity, the tools, the resources for them to be able to carry on and be able to implement what they think is best in their neighborhood, in their communities. Dr. Giacello, um, I love everything that you said there. And there's actually one of the, the things that I thought of with this question um, is an initiative that is, is actually new. So it's not something that we've got metrics that we can take a look at, but I'm, I'm hopeful it's something that will make an impact um, in reducing inequities in healthcare in Chicago um, by deploying many of the things that you, you just mentioned. So it's called the Health First Fund. Um, and the vision of the Health First Fund is a future where health access is universal, quality of life is central, and integrated service delivery is backed by just policies that are informed by community stakeholders. And this vision guides a five-year plan that is going to be led by community partners to increase key levels of connectivity, to narrow the gap between public health and healthcare, and elevate effective long-term solutions for health and wellness um, of our individuals and families in our communities. So the first iteration um, of the Health First Fund are demonstration projects um, from community health centers that are gonna serve as innovative hubs for health transformation. And um, these pilots are ones that eventually can be replicated and scalable um, to reduce and eliminate health disparities um, and improve health outcomes in the Black, Latinx, and uninsured communities in Chicago. Um, and these demonstration projects are also going to partner with, a, with advocacy groups to leverage policy changes that will benefit the entire safety net um, healthcare system. And those policy changes are going to be informed through a community advisory group that is housed not only within Sinai Urban Health Institute, which is a key partner, um, but also at each of the three demonstration projects. Um, and all of them will then partner with the Shriver Center around policy changes. So Community Health is actually incredibly honored to be one of the three demonstration projects that has been selected for the first iteration of the Health First Fund. And within our project, we're gonna be rethinking space and place for points of care. Some of the things we talked about already today around the community health workers, but also through expanding telehealth and through building 
community-based microsites that are housed within community, trusted community organizations, as you said, Dr. Giacello, organizations that have been there through thick and thin for our communities. Um, and what I'm excited to share with everyone today is, if this is something you wanted to learn more about, we're actually going to have an all-in event on September 15th um, from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. on the Health First Fund, where all of the projects and the partners will be part of the discussion for you to learn more. Um, so you can register for this free event at allin-chicago.org. Uh, just wanted to get my little plug in for that event that we're having later this month for All In that relates very much to everything that um, both Dr. Murray and Dr. Giacello just mentioned. So we are out of time. Um, I want to thank all the panelists so much uh, and let the audience know that we are going to try to do our best to follow up on the questions that may have not been asked. And so look out in your emails for some responses. Um, and I would like to re-invite John Koenigsnecht to wrap up today's program. Sorry, everyone. We seem to be having a technical difficulty. Give us one second, please. John, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear All me? All right. Yes, go for it. I'm glad this happened at the end of the program and not at the beginning, so no problems. Uh, thanks to all of our panelists for a fantastic discussion this morning. We really appreciate not only your time, but your insight. Uh, it was very important to have this discussion. As I mentioned earlier uh, today, the program was brought to you by Community Health. And I wish I could invite all of you to see firsthand our facility and the incredible services and specialty care that are provided at Community Health. But we'll do that after we get through this current crisis. You all have an open invitation when the time is right. Uh, all of your ticket sales and any donations that you make today will support Community Health's mission to serve those without essential health care. Please consider making a donation or a contribution now to support Community Health instructions should be appearing at the bottom of your screen. I know this will sound incredible, but because of the model and the hard work and dedication of our staff and volunteers and partnerships, for every $1 donated, we're able to provide $7 worth of direct patient care. That's a model that should be the envy of anyone. And so you did hear it correctly. For every $1 donated, you help us provide $7 worth of patient care and free pharmaceuticals, et cetera. Your contributions here and to community health are being put to very good use. On behalf of the board of directors, staff, and volunteers at Community Health, I want to sincerely thank you from the bottom of our hearts for being part of the sixth annual All in Chicago Breakfast Summit. I hope you are leaving today with ideas for how we can work together to make the vision of access to care for all those in our Chicago and surrounding communities a reality. We have seven more events coming up through the rest of this month and they're all free to attend. I hope you can participate. Our staff has been working very hard on this, and to be honest, I'm exhausted just even talking about it, to bring you this entire series this month for All In Chicago. I strongly encourage you to check out the website, allin-chicago.org, to learn more about the great events coming up and to register to be All In. We all have a critical role to play in this effort. Thank you for being part of today's kickoff event. Be well and stay safe.